Hello, and thanks for joining us. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on working together to protect your water source. My name is Tess Clark. I work here at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. I'm happy to report that we have a diverse audience for today. There's over 300 registrants joining us from across the U.S., as you can see here. We also provide a certificate of attendance for viewing this webinar today from the American Waterworks Association. Please note that this webinar has not been submitted to licensing agencies for pre-approval. You must check with your licensing agency to learn about its criteria, rules, and what you need to do in order to receive credit. Uh, if you do need assistance, you can contact education services at, at awwa.org. I'd like to turn it over to Ed Suslovic, coming to you with the New England Environmental Finance Center. Great. Thank you, Tess. Um, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to uh, tune into the webinar today. Uh, we've got a great panel, and we're sitting here looking out at a beautiful fall day on the campus of the Ed Muskie Public Policy School here at the University of Southern Maine. As I said, I'm Ed Suslovic. I'm a program manager at the New England Environmental Finance Center. Uh, with me is Paul Hunt, who is the environmental manager for the Portland Water District and has been with the district for almost 20 years now. Um, we also have Chad Thompson, who is uh, the source protection coordinator for the Portland Water District. He's got uh, 20 years with the system, uh, with the district, and 11 years in his current position. So he actually outranks Paul, seniority-wise. <laughs> and then uh, Laurel Jackson. Laurel is a water resources specialist, and Laurel's been with the district for an even dozen years and in a current position for eight. So we've got uh, three people um, that have really um, embraced the concept of collaboration in terms of accomplishing the mission of the, the Portland Water District. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, a, a group uh, came together here at the uh, Environmental Finance Center here in New England to look at what are some effective strategies uh, in terms of conserving uh, and, and protecting uh, sources of drinking water. And um, very quickly, that group um, honed in on the fact that uh, water utilities, um, most of them are not in a position to protect their, their source of drinking water by themselves unilaterally. That almost all of them um, really, there's, there's sources, uh, entities beyond their control um, that they would need to partner with in order to really effectively protect uh, the water source from all the various threats. So we, we developed this uh, graphic, uh, we call it the donut of collaboration because it enabled us to bring donuts to every meeting where we discuss this. And I'm actually gonna come back to donuts in terms of uh, a, a way to encourage collaboration. Uh, but in that, the, the, the water utility is at the center of the donut and around it are the different types of, of uh, entities that we identified that water utilities either currently do or could potentially collaborate with in order to protect uh, the water supply. Um, two of them that we're going to focus on today are on the upper right, the land conservation uh, in terms of protecting uh, uh, watersheds from uh, threats um, and uh, municipal planning. Uh, in terms of uh, whether it's uh, in New England, it's mainly local municipal government or in uh, most of the other parts of the country, it would be county government in terms of the, the land use, uh, both planning and, and uh, regulatory functions uh, that typically are, are carried out by uh, local government entities, as I said, either municipal or, or county. But I do want to mention, and, and in the poll question, it's interesting that, that people are already collaborating. A, a lot, the biggest number was with education and to accomplish education and outreach in the community, whether that's with schools, civic groups, universities. Um, clearly, we identified emergency response coordination as, as a critical element. Um, and there, you can't wait till the event happens to collaborate. As we all know, you have to collaborate in advance because it's the planning uh, that really, and the, the relationship building that really matters. And then in, in terms of water quality monitoring, um, we most commonly identified Lake associations is, is a great example of uh, folks that have a, a similar interest uh, in terms of protecting the, the, the source water. Um, but sometimes um, you have to overcome some trust issues in order to, to build that relationship. So that's the, 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 the history of how we, we got to this topic, um, the, the broad scope. And today we're going to really dive in, pardon the pun, uh, to two of those relationships and, and really look at how they came about what it takes to keep them going, and what are some of the challenges uh, in order to both develop them in the first place, but to keep them going. Some, some 
quick elements of a collaborative relationship is typically it's a voluntary relationship. True collaboration is, is not forced, it's, it's voluntary. Uh, one of the things that brings the, the, the parties to the table is that there's got to be a mutual benefit to everyone at the table. It can't be an exploitative relationship where one side is gaining all the benefit at the expense of another. Um, and there's got to be an exchange of resources as well, that everyone brings some resources to the table, hopefully different resources, and then they're exchanged at the table and, and with the result that there's a benefit to, to all. Um, some of the challenges that we identified uh, in terms of, of any type of collaborative relationship were who, who are you going to collaborate with? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that with Chad and Laurel about identifying who, who in fact could be a, a good potential uh, partner. Why? Um, well, clearly in, a, in a, a climate where we have diminishing resources for a lot of uh, entities, pressure on uh, to keep rates down, uh, if we can get more done by collaborating, then that's obviously going to uh, yield greater benefits. Um, what is the, the best project to collaborate on? And I think, again, today we'll, we'll, we'll hear about what were those early steps and, and why were those early steps successful? Um, because they clearly identified uh, the right project to collaborate on. Um, and the big one is how. how. How does a collaborative relationship come about? But even more importantly, how do you sustain that collaborative relationship? So it's not just a one-off. It takes resources to invest upfront in terms of uh, building a collaborative relationship. In order to maximize the return on that investment, you wanna make sure that you're doing it in a way that is sustainable so that the collaborative relationship lasts uh, the test of time. It also lasts beyond turnover, for example, of the key personnel that may be the ones that um, initiated it. Um, something that we did identify when we did a round table, for example, with land, land conservation agencies, was language. Uh, water utilities have their own language. In this case, land conservation agencies or any of these, these groups around the circle have their own lingo, their own jargon, their own acronyms. Um, and it was interesting that that was one of the first things that we identified is we had to figure out how to speak a common language. Something else was uh, people are busy. Uh, people are already feeling overworked and sometimes can see this effort to develop a collaborative relationship as something they simply don't have time for. And so the ch a challenge is how do people, how can people come to see that investing in, in creating a collaborative relationship will actually yield greater results than trying to do things um, on your own. So th those were the, the, the reasons why um, here at the New England Environmental Finance Center, working with our friends at the Portland Water District and other water utilities, working with our folks at, at state agencies, um, land conservation groups, uh, local governments, lakes associations, um, emergency response and planning entities, as well as high schools and, and colleges and universities, we really saw that the landscape was um, already populated with some very important and successful collaborative relationships, but we all saw a need that, that uh, more could be done, and in fact, more needs to be done as we, we move into the future with more and more threats to um, uh, drinking water supplies. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Hunt, uh, who, as I mentioned, um, is with the Portland Water District. And Paul really, in, in some ways, is the, the granddaddy of collaboration in terms of um, the approach he brings to, to, to his work and the fact that um, you, you started this process long before it was even a buzzword. So uh, can you start off by maybe telling us a little bit about the, 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 the Portland Water District and the challenges it faces so we can understand why it, it came to be such a collaborative partner. Sure, yeah, thanks for um, introducing me. Granddaddy sounds old, but other than that, I, I appreciate the introduction. Um, yeah, if you could put on that slide. Um, so I work for the Portland Water District and have for almost 20 years, and I'm not just saying this because my boss could be listening. It really is the best uh, job I've ever had because I feel like there's a very clear mission and that it's shared by virtually everyone in the company, and it just makes it a joy to do this work. Um, the Portland Water District has been providing drinking water since 1908 to the greater Portland area, which is Maine's most populated um, area. We provide water to 200,000 consumers in 11 communities. Um, over the 20 years, even as the population has grown, we haven't increased the number of, of the amount of water we're providing. It's been pretty steady, right around 22 million gallons per day, which if you do the math times 365 is about 8 billion gallons per year of drinking water that we're providing. 
Our source of drinking water is Maine's second largest and deepest lake. It's known as Sebago Lake. And as you can see, it's astonishingly beautiful, um, especially beautiful when you're the environmental manager because that lake, as you're looking at it right there, holds about 800 billion gallons of water. And as I said, we use 8 billion in a year. So that represents 100 years worth of water sitting there, which is a, a very enviable position to be in. It's a, we, we have enough water to meet the needs of our, of our region for decades. So we just, of course, have to protect it. Um, I would say a few things, maybe the most important thing I would say since I'm talking to, um, since I'm talking to, um, sorry, I wanted to stay on this slide, okay, is that every drinking water source is different. And like snowflakes, like they're all different. They're similar in that we're providing drinking water just as you are in other parts of the country, but it's really important to assess what, is, what are the unique features, natural features and political features that make our situation either challenging or not, and build your source protection program with that in mind. Um, Sebago Lake is unusual in that in the United States, there are only about 50 surface water supplies that are granted an exemption to the filtration requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act, and Sebago Lake is one of those 50. What that means is that it has outstanding water quality and has to have an active and effective watershed control program. Um, and that's what really our collaborative work with other entities is part of our watershed control program. Um, another, and another unusual aspect of Sebago Lake, you can see this is a map showing the Sebago Lake watershed. Um, and it's about 280,000 acres in area. Uh, and you can see that it's, ex it's, it's long and skinny and it extends northwest of the lake. That's really good news because the south and, and east of the lake is the more developed populated part of greater Portland. And if that was part of the watershed, the water quality in the lake wouldn't be as high as it is because the part of Maine that makes up the Sebago Lake watershed is largely forested. It's about 85% forested, um, which sounds great. That's why the water is so clean, but it's also more than 90% privately owned land, meaning Lots of activity is happening up there, and the pictures on the left are meant to represent that. Logging activity is, is common in the watershed. Boys and girls camps are all over the place and other vacation activities. There's development in the shoreland zone and throughout the watershed, and there's boating and other forms of recreation. So our challenge is that the lake is very clean, but it's also very popular and used by many people for many things. So protecting it, requires kind of a multifaceted source protection program or watershed control program. We have a short video here, it's about a minute and a half long, that will highlight some of the things that uh, our lake protection group, which includes Chad and Laurel and others, do day after day to keep the lake clean. Have source protection, the lake would turn green with algae. There would be a lot more bacteria in the lake. It would be a lot more expensive to treat the water. Best thing for lakes is to be surrounded by forest. So having a forested watershed produces really good water quality. One way to keep the watershed forested is through land conservation. Our biggest program is called Waterways, and that serves sixth grade students at seven schools, and we see about a thousand students. Three number and number goes into these schools for a month at a time, and she teaches students various aspects of source protection. The land around the lake will serve as a filter, and what we want to do is we want to monitor the use of the land around the lake. That affects water quality, and that's our goal down here with property management around Sebago Lake and Lower Bay. Sebago Lake provides drinking water for 200,000 people, which is a fifth of Maine, and we provide water and wastewater services to 11 municipalities in the greater Portland area. Well, just keeping the water clean to start with is way better off for the customers 
um, for everyone than trying to treat it after it gets dirty. That's that's probably the main take home for what we do. Okay, I heard that there were maybe some issues with water with uh, the audio on that. So I'm going to try playing that again. Um, okay, if we could hear it at the end, test, just not at the beginning. Okay, so I'm just going to try one more thing. So now it should be a different, coming through a different way. We didn't have source protection the lake would turn green with algae there would be a lot more bacteria in the lake it would be a lot more expensive to treat the water best thing for lakes is to be surrounded by forest so having a forested watershed produces really good water quality one way to keep the watershed forested is through land conservation our biggest program is called waterways and that serves sixth grade students at seven schools and we see about a thousand students Rena Brown, who's our educator, goes into these schools for a month at a time, and she teaches students various aspects of source protection. The land around the lake will serve as a filter, and what we want to do is we want to monitor the use of the land around the lake. That affects water quality, and that's our goal down here with property management around Sebago Lake and Lower Bay. Sebago Lake provides drinking water for 200,000 people, which is a fifth of Maine, and we provide water and wastewater services to 11 municipalities in the greater Portland area. You know, just keeping the water clean to start with is way better off for the customers, uh, for everyone, than trying to treat it after it gets dirty. That's, that's probably the main take home for what we do. But, Paul, do you want to just summarize what we would have heard? Yeah, well, what I will say is that we have that video plus a series of others, which is an outreach initiative, a uh, recent outreach initiative by the group, to, so the public could understand better what it is that we do. If anybody wants to see the video and hear it, as well as and the others, send us an email and we will send, a, send you links so that you can see them all. Um, the, the point that, that the video makes and that I would like to make is just that when you have a lake that has many uses and many, um, it's loved by so many for so many things, in addition to being a water supply, you, ha you have no choice but to do many different things to protect it and also to work with many other individuals and organizations uh, because we can't do it alone. Um, the biggest challenge we face, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Ed, so you can talk to Chad about this in more detail, is that we, as the water utility, have a responsibility to our customers that the water is always safe to drink and, and remains that way, yet we have very little authority to enforce laws or regulations in that whole area, 280,000 acres that you see on the screen. So our source protection program is really about finding ways to work with others who have authority in, in ways that can benefit us. So I'll turn that back over to you, Ed, so you can, um, so you can talk with Chad about some of the details of that. Great. Um, so um, Chad, and again, uh, to our um, audience, um, obviously we're talking using the Portland Water District, and I just got to remind people, it's Portland, Maine, not Oregon, Portland, Maine. Um, but the issues of the, the, the threats, the challenges in, in protecting the, the, the source of drinking water, I think, I think they're pretty universal in, in scope. So, um, Chad, you've been doing this for a while. Um, as, as Paul just mentioned, um, we're in a situation where, you know, you, you, you don't get to, to call the shots necessarily in terms of land use and regulatory and planning. So um, can you tell me a little bit about how you, how the Portland Water District and what, what you and your crew do in terms of collaborating with units of local government? Right, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, as Paul mentioned, you know, Sebago is a huge lake. It's a multi-use lake. And there are really, we have very little authority to, uh, to 
can gauge the rules around protect, you know, to enforce rules that are in place. Uh, generally, uh, generally speaking, there are three sets of rules. In Maine, there are shoreland zoning law, there's septic system rules uh, for, for septic system installation and design around the lake. And there's also a set of laws called the Natural Resource Protection Law, uh, the per Natural Resource Protection Act, rather. And those, those rules are enforced, or the regulatory, regulatory authority sits with the local municipality and or state government in the, in the, the main department of, of environmental protection. Portland Water District doesn't have any jurisdiction over those rules, so we 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 can't legally enforce them. Uh, so the the approach that we that we take is to collaborate with the entities that do have the regulatory authority. Uh, both just to give an example, the, the types of laws that we're talking about and the rules that that we're talking about are are types of th things like as uh, tree cutting, uh, vegetation removal setbacks to buildings, soil disturbance, uh, shorefront stabilization projects, protection of wetlands, all things that uh, if done well, protect the lake, but if done poorly, are threats to the lake, you know, water quality of the lake. So what I'm hearing you say is the water district has the responsibility for protecting the, 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 the water and, and the watershed, but not very much in the way of authority very very little authority we have a little bit of authority over the septic system angle from actually 1913 with the legislature in maine uh, but over all of the other things i mentioned we have no legal authority to do it now do we have x do we have influence absolutely you know we serve drinking water to about 15 percent of the state's population uh, when when we speak the public generally listens um, but that said, you know, we, we, we have to find a way to, to provide uh, value or add value to the entities that do have the regulatory authority, the code enforcement officers for seven towns surrounding Sebago Lake, for instance. They're, they have the jurisdiction over shoreland zoning law. So, the, the, and uh, as far as state government, that natural resources protection law, that's the regulatory authority is with the state and they have very limited resources. Both the town and the state have less resources than the Portland Water District has to enforce it and to help um, enforce those regulations. So the, the, uh, the angle we take is to, is to be their technical assistance. So we, we offer, we'll go out and do the, the inspections of so the shorefront in, in the shorefront the shoreland zone We'll go out and do the inspections. We'll talk with the property owners. We'll be the liaison between the property owner, the developer, and the uh, regulatory agency that exists. So we, in, in essence, we can do a lot of the work for those regulatory agents and, um, and be, the, be the liaison with them. So oftentimes preventing issues and in some cases, solving issues by you know communicating with them and deciding on the best route forward. Chad, as, as a former municipal elected official myself, we often refer to Maine as the land of local control, that, that the, the municipality is a sovereign city-state unto itself. Can you tell me how you uh, were able to um, overcome maybe some of the, the, the turf issues that might some often come up in a, in a relationship like this? How, how have you been able to create an environment where you're not seen as big brother or a threat, but rather as a resource to these towns? That's an excellent point, Ed. Probably the, the most work that goes into this is in those personal relationships with the code enforcement officer, with the state, uh, right? The, the, the actual person who's in charge of, right, of enforcing the law for the state or the town. Um, and it really comes down to three things. You know, competency, they've got to recognize that we are competent in what we're doing. We understand the rules. We know how to do it right. Um, and the way, we, the way we address the competency issue is we train all of our staff to be as qualified as the regulatory agent is. So we get certified in those sets of laws by the state to do the work, that, the same way that the code officer does or the same way that the state agent does. Um, Competency is one thing. Trust is a huge issue. You know, the, the person enforcing the, the code enforcement officer, for instance, has to trust us that we're going to work with them, that we're not going to cause more work for them or accuse them of not doing 
you know, their, their job. They need to, they need to trust that um, we have their back and, and support supports a huge one. These, these uh, regulatory agencies are in the position where they have to make a decision that's not necessarily going to be popular. You know, it's, it's a develop, you know, if there's a developer who wants to do this thing, the code officer says, no, you can't do it. Or the state says, no, you can't do it that way. You have to do it this way. It costs a lot more money. They're not necessarily popular decisions. It's really important to them that we back them up on those. So we understand the issues. We often work with the, the code officer or the, or the state to come up with a solution uh, to, to the issue. And then we stand by that issue with, with the town or with, or with, the, or with the state. So we, we uh, kind of make it, we become a more formidable force and, and um, don't leave, we, we help the town and the state by, by uh, having their back. I was just about to say, you, you, you took the words out of my mouth. It sounds like in a good collaborative relationship, people have to know that, that they have each other's backs. It's, it's a critical and, and um, different personalities, it, it, some, some code enforcement officers, some regulatory agents, you know, are kind of the more authoritative type. They want to they wanna make the decisions and it's really important. In other ones, they're, they're more collaborative. They want to make a decision with, with you, your input. Uh, in either case, it's really important. It's a critical part is that, is that we honor their authority as needed and work with them to come up with a solution if that's what they're hoping for us to do. So, so it sounds like the, the collaborative relationship, although it's in a sense between the Portland Water District and, and or rather among the Portland Water District and the, 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 the towns that are in the watershed, it really though starts and ends with a person-to-person -person relationship. Absolutely. It, decisions, uh, you know, collaborations that are forged at the top of an organization are worthless unless they're honored by the people that are actually out there, boots on the ground, people doing the work. Uh, it's, it's all about the relationship between our field staff and their field staff. So that sounds like a great uh, piece of advice for um, a utility, a water utility that is looking to engage in this relationship, that it's great if the people at the top are talking to each other, but what I just heard you say, which I, I wanna reiterate is, the people that are actually going to be out doing the work need to also have that relationship. Is that, am I getting that right? Absolutely. You know, certainly I, I don't mean to minimize the, the collaborative, the, the to, in order to get a collaboration going, it, it oftentimes starts at the top. It oftentimes talk, you know, talking between the, the managers of the organization to say, we should do this. And, and certainly that is a huge part because you have to have the support of both agencies or both organizations in order to go do it. It takes work, it takes time. And, and your organization has to back you in doing that work and doing that and putting in that time. Uh, so it, it, is it safe to say that the, the relationship and therefore the benefits that accrue to both the water district and the, the municipalities is greater today than when, when these relationships first started? It, has, has there been a, a growth in that? There absolutely has it. It has been. We started out collaborating, regula regulating septic systems. Uh, we're we're now a technical assistance role for any and all of these laws, these three sets of laws. We're we're all uh, certified to do it. We are operating in a, in a in a field level technical assistance role in in every aspect of of those sets of laws. Great. Well, don't go anywhere because although we're going to turn next to to Laurel. Um, and talk about land conservation in, in a collaborative way. Um, I want to encourage uh, all the uh, participants in the webinar to keep those questions flowing in because we're definitely saving time uh, to take uh, sp specific questions from uh, all of the webinar participants. So please um, hit the keyboards and, uh, and get those questions flying in. All right, Laurel, um, you've been at this for um, eight years. Yep. Um, and uh, can you, Maybe start from the beginning. How did the the the, the partnerships that, that you now manage and, and continue to grow, mm -hmm. how did these partnerships between the utility and, and land conservation agencies, how did they come into existence? Sure. Um, so you can see uh, in the image on the screen now, that is an outline of the watershed of Sebago Lake. So all of that land area um, eventually drains down to the lake. And then in the red, that's the area where we provide drinking water service. So there's very little overlap there. 
Um, so all of those customers who are receiving water service are receiving the benefit of the forested land and the upper watershed that's providing the natural treatment to produce really clean drinking water in Sebago Lake. Um, you know, Paul talked about the waiver to filtration. That's really, really important. Um, and it's really key to the Portland Water District's ability to um, provide reliable, safe, inexpensive drinking water. Um, so about 15 years ago, before I, this whole thing started, before I even started working on it, um, but about 15 years ago, it was actually the land trusts that initiated the partnership, that initiated the, the first connection between um, the water district and um, the land trusts in the upper watershed. So they came to us and asked if we would um, help them conserve a piece of property in the upper watershed um, by providing some financial support. So, you know, that really um, happened at a time where we were thinking about what we could do to protect those forests um, short of buying land. You know, that's that area of land is 280,000 acres. So, you know, for the Portland Waters to, to, try, to try and buy that, it's just not feasible and it's also not necessary. Um, so the land trusts were already doing the land conservation and all they wanted from us was some financial support. Um, so that's where it started. And since then, it has evolved over time. Um, you know, our, we brought, you know, we, one of the major key steps um, to getting where we are today was educating our board. Um, so having our board support for um, providing the financial uh, contributions towards land, land conservation was really important. Um, so where we are today is that we have a program where we have a formalized partnership with the land trusts operating in the upper watershed um, with clear criteria on what types of land conservation projects we, would, we, will, we will support and to what um, level we will support them. Um, there's an application pro process and clear criteria um, and we're doing a lot more and, and the land trusts are able to conserve a lot more land as well. So what, what I just heard there was, was uh, echoing something that Chad had said that, that um, you need uh, support both at both ends of an organization. Absolutely. And, and, and you, you, I just want to reiterate what you just said in terms of making sure that the board of, of directors, the board of trustees for the utility uh, had to be educated mm -hmm. in terms of the benefits of collaborating. This was not something right. that had always been done. Right. And they needed to, to support it um, and, and see that there, there was, in fact, a, a return on the, on the investment the utility was making. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it, and like I mentioned, this was something that evolved over time. We didn't, you know, just jump right into it. It started as sort of a slow ad hoc request basis. Um, and then it evolved to educating the board enough so that they would adopt a formalized policy stating that they, they supported land conservation. So that was a big step as well. Um, but, you know, it took time and it took, you know, investment, an investment of time at the staff level. Um, but I think it was really important that we went through that process so that we have, you know, really a really um, enthusiastic and really supportive uh, board of trustees now. So, Laura, it's, it sounds like this um, started in, in, in almost an organic fashion, mm -hmm. um, that the, the, the land trust, you said they came to you, the, the district first, and yeah. said, you know, we, we want to conserve some land, can you help us do that? Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about some of the challenges you've had to overcome, both internal and external. You mentioned um, developing clear, consistent policies. Are there other challenges that, that either you've had to overcome or that you're facing today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest obstacles is just the learning curve. Um, you know, the Portland Water District is a water utility. We know how to treat water. We know how to deliver water. We know how to protect the lake around the shoreland zone. But um, when we first started doing this, we didn't know a lot about the um, mechanics of land conservation. So, you know, just the first step was educating ourselves about you know, first, what land trusts are operating in the watershed. So you can see this image here. We have um, two major ones, but little pieces of other ones. So what land trusts are they? What are their service areas? Who are their directors? You know, what does their staff look like, um, you know, in terms of structure? So just getting that down um, and then getting the communication in place. Um, you know, commun communication is a huge piece of collaboration, I think, especially as our program was evolving, things changed. Um, you know, some we had to be 
clear with the land trust about what the expectations were as they were shifting. So we didn't always have an application and now we do. So we needed them to know that they needed to fill that out and, and get it to us, you know, two months ahead of time. We needed to, to make sure that they knew that, that that needed to come to us before the closing, just those types of things, um, you know, because we need, as our program was developed, it was important that they know you know, how we work and how they can work with us. So you had to move beyond the let's meet for coffee and donuts and talk about this to a more formal process yeah. because as you point out, there's multiple potential partners now. Right. So it's not just a one-on-one. -on -one. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, as you look to the, to the future, um, because clearly, like many places in the country, development pressure is, is growing, especially in, in, in uh, the southern part of the watershed. Um, what do you see um, happening in the future? Do you see a, 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 a rosy outlook for collaboration, <laughs> or do you think this is, this is just a, a, a fad and it's mm -hmm, going to go away? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think we have a really good outlook for collaboration in the future. One of the cool things that have happened um, since we've been working on this is that we have had more partners join in. Um, so it, start, it started with the Portland Water District, Loon Echo Land Trust, Western Hotels Land Trust meeting periodically, um, and that went on for you know a number of years. And we would you know give them some money for their projects, um, and other organizations noticed that, and they noticed this really unique partnership between the water utility and the land trust, and they thought, hey, that's cool. I want to get involved in that, and I you know want to bring my resources to the table and see what we can do together. So now we have this formalized partnership called Sebago Clean Waters with all of these organizations. And that's something that has happened um, over the last couple of years, but it was a collaboration that grew organically over time as well. Um, much like our program, it, it evolved and it, and it took some time to get where we are today. But, you know, now we're at a place where we have some momentum as this um, partnership. We recently got a uh, healthy Watershed Consortium grant through the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. Um, so that grant is for $350,000 over the next two and a half years um, to work towards increasing the pace of land conservation in the watershed. Um, and that's something that we could never have done on our own. Um, the land trust couldn't have done on, on their own. So having all of these partners really benefits everyone. Um, everyone has different resources, different skills. Um, and different expertise. So we have some momentum going forward. So I'm pretty excited to see what's gonna happen in the next few years. Looking at this slide, Laurel, that's a pretty impressive collection of, of um, entities yeah. uh, that are coming together. I have to ask though, okay. um, make believe that, that, that none of this had happened. Mm -hmm. You're just starting out now. There's, there's, there's no history of collaboration. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be more successful? Doing one land conservation agreement with one land trust or, or, or would you suggest trying to get all these people in the room at once to talk about it? I think you have to start with one project with one land trust and build it over time. Um, like Chad mentioned, there's also the, the trust building. You if, if you in, if you called all these people up and asked them to come to a meeting, they would be suspicious. They would say, what is going on and what's their angle? Um, so I think you really need to, to start with something concrete and start with something small um you know and build the trust and and learn how to work together um and bring other people in you know over time that sounds to me like really good advice in terms of beginning a collaborative relationship is don't try to bite off more than you yeah. can chew <laughs> at once um, because you'll choke on it right um and i i think this is a great example of that laurel that yeah. That, as you say, this this unbelievable collection of players has come together because of the success over years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that's any other thoughts on um, a water utility that um, may be listening, uh, tuning in today and casting about saying, gee, um, if we wanted to, to, to start this, what are some suggestions you would have to, for somebody starting out on, on mm -hmm. this path? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the major things is identifying the common goals that you your organization has and a land trust has so one of the benefits that we see of working with land trusts is that um, we get the benefit of the conservation happening without the responsibility of managing the land 
Um, so, you know, the water utility has a lot of responsibilities and a lot of things going, and especially with small water systems, you don't want to be thinking about managing, you know, 200, 400, 500 acres of forest um, when somebody else already knows how to do that and already has the expertise. Um, so if you can identify some areas where, um, you know, there's some overlap between things you, you are doing or you would be doing and things that other organizations are also doing and maybe are doing better um, or are, you know, they have more expertise in that, then I think that's a good place to start. Um, and you have to get to know the people, um, you know, we're busy, but if you can sit down and have a cup of coffee and, and a conversation, um, that's a great place to start. So again, I'm, I'm hearing both you and Chad talk about the importance of developing those personal relationships with folks so that you can then have something to build on and, and create eventually institutional collaborative relationships, mm -hmm. but it does start with the people. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned um, clear, uh, communication mm -hmm. as being important. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about um, one issue that, I, that came up certainly when we did the round table with water, different water utilities and different land conservation agencies was, how do you reach common ground on to say, okay, we want to, well, let me put it this way. What conserving a piece of land can mean one thing to a, mm -hmm. a, a land trust can mean something very different to a, a water utility. Right. Talk to me a little bit about the, the challenges uh, around what types of land use you would allow versus what the land trust would allow and how do you work those out? Right, so I think one of the things to consider in that regard is what the purpose of conserving the land is for. So if it's in your intake area and it's very close to your intakes, then you don't want, you want no trespassing. The purpose of, of protecting that land is for security um, and it's for you know mitigating acute risks to the watershed. Um, so perhaps, you know, owning that land is better, um, but maybe there are other places where the purpose of conserving the land is for the water quality protection of keeping the forest, um, not having development, um, and that, and you know, and, and that's the reason why you want the land to be protected. And in that regard, you know, you could work with a land trust, a land trust to conserve that land and, and allow for low impact recreation. Um, that's something that the Portland Water District does on the land that we actually own, is that we fence off the areas that need to be no trespassing, and then the rest is open for hiking and biking, um, you know, and walking, and, and anything that's not going to cause uh, erosion or um, threats to the nearby water bodies. And, and that's something that I think the land trusts would be amenable to as well. Um, there are, they make agreements with, you know, funding sources all the time for types of allowed uses. Um, so if you wanted to say no ATVs, that could be, you know, I think that they would be open to that. It, it, it sounds like though, um, in order to, to be a successful and a sustainable collaborative mm -hmm. relationship, the water utility and the, the land trust need to iron all this out before they walk into the closing. Yes, probably absolutely. the closing is probably not a good place to be right. cashing this out. I'm yeah, guessing. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you need to have these conversations beforehand. Um, you know, and be and be pretty clear about what the expectations of both groups are. Um, yeah, certainly that wouldn't be a great partnership if that's how it went. <laughs> so um, thank you both, Laurel and, and, and Chad, for giving us some, some of the real nitty gritty that is involved in both starting and then maintaining and growing a collaborative relationship. Um, let's turn to, uh, oh, my last question, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, because, uh, one of your earlier slides reminded me of mm -hmm. this. Um, sometimes there's multiple land conservation entities. Mm -hmm. How does a water utility figure out who's who's playing in their sandbox? Who's who's active in their <laughs> watershed? So there's a couple of different resources. If you're in Maine, uh, you can go to the Maine Drinking Water Program website. The address is on the screen there. Um, and we can send you this information as well. They have a nice uh, Google Earth platform that shows uh, wellhead protection areas and overlaid with um, land trust service areas. So you can get really specific on that um, website. And then if you're outside Maine, um, the Land Trust Alliance has a, has a find a land trust page um, where you can you know, go to your area, your um, source water area and see what land trusts are operating in that area. And you know, talk to the people in your town. I'm sure um, the municipal leaders and maybe your neighbors, um, they might have, have information about, about um, the land trusts that are working in your area. And, and as, as Chad mentioned earlier, um, cl clearly uh, 
you probably want to be touching base with your units of local government, be they county mm -hmm. or, or city or town, because they obviously have a, 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 a viewpoint on land conservation, you know, what what in their comprehensive plans, what they're looking to do and, sure. and whatnot as well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, great. Well, now it's time for us to turn to the most important part of today's <laughs> uh, program, which is um, questions and, and hopefully answers. Um, hopefully. So, um, Tess, do you want to uh, uh, share with us any of the questions that have come in so far? Absolutely. So there have been quite a few questions and we'll do our best to get them all asked. Please keep sending them. Uh, I'm sure there will be many more and um, use the question dialog box to do that. Um, so we got a lot of questions that were asking about how the uh, agreement or the formal agreement with land trusts works between the water district and the land trust uh, grant program. Um, so the questions kind of are about what's the budget and then how does that, uh, what is the result, what portion of the watershed does the land trust control or conserve? So the application process, um, the land trust applies to the Portland Water District. So the land trust and the landowner do all of the negotiations and then they apply to the Portland Water District um, for whatever um, amount of money they think they need. Um, and then the Water District has a formula that we use that we developed and it's based on what the water quality benefit of protecting the land is. So it looks at features like um, how forested is it? How, what does it have for wetlands? Um, if, it, if it's in a buffer area next to a river or lake, um, that's better for water quality. So any parcel is eligible, but the amount of money that the land trust receives to conserve the parcel is based on what the water quality benefit is. So um, land trusts are eligible to receive up to 25% of the acquisition value. Um, so for a really high quality piece of property, um, we would pay 25% of the acquisition value um, to the land trust. And then at that point, um, the water district requires that the land be uh, legally protected from development in some fashion. So a conservation easement or um, a declaration of trust or some legal mechanism so that we know that it won't turn into a parking lot um, or a Walmart in the future. And then beyond that, it's really up to the land trust to do the monitoring um, and the enforcement on that property in perpetuity. And, and so, um, Paul, do you want to talk a little bit about, from the water district's point of view, the justification for, for allocating resources, because God knows there's never enough resources in, in, in the budget. How, how does the water district uh, justify allocating um, budgetary resources to, to, to do this plan? Acquisition. Okay, that's a very good question. <clears throat> and the shortest way to answer it is that we don't have the resources to purchase all. If you had a small enough watershed that your water utility could actually contemplate buying all the land, well, by all means, if you can do that, that's ideal. We could never do that. Then it would be hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to purchase all the land in the watershed, maybe even a billion dollars. It would be so much that we could never contemplate it. So we only own 1% of the land in the watershed. The rest of it is owned by others and only about 10 to 12% of it is currently conserved in some way, meaning state park, national forest, or owned by a land trust. Um, so our goal is to see that increase. And the, the logic behind it is that if the forest disappears, the cost of treatment will go up dramatically. We have an exemption to filtration just putting in filtration would probably cost $150 million for us. So if we can avoid that by helping the land trust do more of what they already want to do anyway, and with willing landowners who also want to conserve the land, that just to our board makes perfect sense. Yeah, the, 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 the trees, it's, it's, it's cheaper to conserve trees than to build and operate a filter plant. Gray is cheaper than green. Green is green cheaper is than gray. gray. <laughs> I know there was a slogan. In and there. better. Is there another category of questions, Tess? Yes, there's a, they're all rolling in now. So I think both Paul or Laurel could possibly both could answer this. But what kind of relationship do you have with neighboring water utilities regarding watershed protection, not just land trusts? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. What sort of relationship with neighboring water utilities? Well, we have relationships, of course, uh, you know, across the state with 
other water utilities who have expertise we don't have, who who are knowledgeable in things. You know, we, we're part of several state associations, but as far as collaborating to protect Sebago Lake, I don't know that we really collaborate with other water utilities, but we collaborate with other statewide entities that are involved in lake protection generally. And so we have, I think we make a list every year. Let's make a list of all the organizations that we have some collaboration with during the year. It could be just a one-time thing or it could be a full-blown program like with the land trust. And there's about a hundred organizations in any, in every year that we have relationships with. But is it fair to say that a, a growing number of, of water utilities in our neck of the woods in, in Maine have now or are looking to collaborate to with land trusts uh, and other land conservation agencies? To more or lesser degrees. I think you said earlier one of your comments about Maine just kind of by our nature is that you know home rule is something people value and I think for some utilities the idea of we don't own the land and yet it's providing you know it's protecting our water supply they might be uncomfortable with that or think that that's too risky we really don't have any choice because there's no way we could own right. a significant percentage of the watershed so i think again it's you have to look at your particular situation yep. how about another question tess yeah and this is similar um you know this is sort of about the municipality level and how you how, how your experience working with municipalities has been, especially since many want to preserve their tax base? Um, certainly as a, as, a, as a former local elected official, um, that's you know why when, when Laurel was, was commenting that you know working with the municipalities and, and, and again, and maybe building upon the work that, that, that Chad and his team have done, um, you certainly want to um, have the, 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 the local government, uh, involved in these discussions, involved in uh, a strategic discussion about um, that the utility has a goal of protecting the watershed, and that you know, as as Paul showed in the slides, it doesn't mean freezing everyone out of the watershed, but um, there are some locations that that really do need to be conserved. Um, with Chad and his team doing a better job of of enforcement and and planning on on where the land is being developed. Um, but I think that, that the, the main thing is that the municipal folks are in the loop communication wise. Would you guys add anything to that? I would just say that when we were working on developing our program, we did reach out to the watershed municipalities to make sure that they weren't opposed to what we were doing. So before our board would vote on adopting the land conservation policy, um, stating our, our support for conservation and our, our working principles, um, they wanted to make sure that they weren't we weren't stepping on anybody's toes or doing something that the municipalities weren't in favor of. And so um, we did that and and got, you know, responses that were favorable um, for, from everyone, favorable, favorable or neutral from, to, from everyone that we reached out to. Um, and currently we're working on that as well. We have, you know, a couple of big projects in the works through Sebago Clean Waters and the land trusts are liaising with the towns to um, ensure that that they are supportive of those projects as well. Yeah. That, and I might just add that if we, in, in part of the outreach that we've done, you know, in this arena and others, town manager, several town managers have expressed to us that actually development in, in a rural setting can actually cost, cost the town more uh, than, than conservation. So the conservation easement's an asset, whereas development in the far reaches of the town where they got to do road plowing and school buses and all that costs actually cost the town money. Yeah. Right. And, and, and next question, Tess. Yeah, so there's a couple questions about data that I'm kind of hoping to combine here. Um, how do you work? How do you work with land trusts to monitor data? And do you ever work with parcel level data? We do to some extent. Um, we have worked on some watershed prioritization projects, um, prioritizing parcels based on their um, attributes. Um, but really, we're working with willing landowners. So um, you can look at data and you know prioritize as 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 long as the day is long or whatever that saying is. But um, when it comes down to it, you, you you will only conserve the land that the landowner wants to conserve. Um, so that's been our our approach with that. Um, you know, and, and we also are uh, hesitant to um, you know target parcels or, or do anything like that. Um, you know, people around here don't 
aren't necessarily amenable to that type of approach. Right, it sort of moves to the parcel level once a landowner has raised his or her hand and expressed an interest in, I wanna conserve my land, then we start looking at, well, what are the attributes of this parcel? Right. Therefore, how much money is it eligible for? In the meantime, there's no reason to do that. There are probably 30,000 parcels out there, and we're only going to conserve a tiny percentage of them anyway with the land trust. So we kind of wait until the landowner has identified him or herself. Great. Great. Does that, does that address that concern? Uh, it does in my mind. I think that was a very <laughs> comprehensive answer. Um, I also want to quickly um, send out in the chat our evaluation link since we're reaching the end of our scheduled hour. Um, we can spend another minute or two doing questions if there's going to be, I see more questions are rolling in. So I'm going to send this out quickly to everyone. And we'll take, I think, one more question if that's okay with everyone. Go for it. Okay. All right, what do you do with a land trust or another entity that doesn't want to collaborate or wants you to leave them alone? Oh, good, good question. <laughs> well, my, Have you run into that yet? You know, oh, I mean, I don't know on the land trust level, but again, of the hundred organizations in a year that we collaborate with, people change. You know, you might be working very, you know, in conjunction with another organization and it's going smoothly. Someone leaves, a new person comes in, maybe they view it differently. Um, conditions on the ground change like collaborations are kind of like they have a lifespan they're not all going to last forever so you know laurel pointed out that a good way to start a collaboration is on with a concrete project you know what you might find that when you finish that project you're kind of done you've you've met your goals together and you don't see a need to go further either one or both of you don't but there is no really no point in a collaboration that's one-sided it's going to take a lot collaborations are hard work as anyway even when they're going beautifully there's time there's effort and there's only so many hours in the day so my recommendation would be to work with everybody who wants to work with you that'll probably take all the time you have in any way and leave the other ones for another day another person of a future you know maybe it'll work in the future I, I worked with someone for many years who said you know source protection is like planting seeds sometimes you work on it and it isn't until five years later that it actually starts sprouting yeah and, and, and i would just say in, in in developing collaborative relationships i never use the word no i just always hear i don't hear no i hear not now not yet not this project um as opposed to a, an outright no or sometimes not with this person as paul mentioned so um i i want to thank the, the the panelists from the portland water district paul and laurel and chad because um, they've been out there doing this uh, and, been, and, and have created a very successful culture of collaboration, not just in the water district, but in the entire watershed. And to me, it's, it's an inspiration um, uh, for the rest of us in terms of how much we can get done through collaboration. So thank you very much. Thank Welcome you. for having us. Okay, and then to wrap up, we just have one or two more polls. The first one, we just ask um, if you're interested in receiving in-depth technical assistance, um, we do, this is a service that the Environmental Finance Center Network provides for small systems. So if you have an immediate need and you know that you could use some help, you can tell us here and we will get in touch with you. Um, I'm going to give you a couple more seconds to respond and all set. And then lastly, uh, we do have a blog, like I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, and if you have a desire to read it or want to subscribe, this is another way you can do that. We can subscribe you directly. So uh, take a couple seconds and you can let us know here. And I will then turn it back over to Ed for some closing comments. All right. Okay, Ed, what, do you, what closing comments do you have? Well, I, I, I think the, the closing comments are, um, Collaboration can be a little scary. It can feel a little um, risky, like you're, you're not stepping on solid ground when you first begin it, uh, because it can be a little uh, murky. Um, a lot of it is, as Chad mentioned, and as, as Laurel and, and, and Paul as well, um, it really is developing relationships um, with individuals, start small. Um, don't try to get 25 people in the room together at once to start a collaborative relationship. That, that hopefully can be the the end point, not the end point, but a, a waypoint down the road, as, as, as Laurel pointed out. 
Um, but it really is a matter of starting small, finding something where both sides stand to benefit. I think that, and, 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 and I might, might just add, I, I didn't mention this, but it, it was in my notes. Um, continuity of the of the collaboration is critical. You know, you, you can't decide, you can't just say we're going to collaborate on this and then make it two months before we talk again. You know, the best collaborations are the ones that you revisit off, often. They'll, they'll stand the test of time often. So you found something that you're collaborating on that is a core thing for both utilities when you're both organizations when you found something that you collaborate on frequently. Great reminder. So I'll end with this because Chad just made me think of it. Collaboration is like a marriage. You have to work at it every day. Great. Well, thanks everyone. And I hope to you will join us again for our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tess.